draw our heads in prayer. Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for this morning, Lord. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your grace. I thank you, Lord, that we can come before you and we can worship you. We can offer up our praises and our worship to you. I thank you, Lord, that even as you are alive when you are exalted and you are seated on the throne you consider us or for some of us you want to consider us as those among the living and not dead I pray Lord for your presence to be in this place I pray Lord Jesus that your Holy Spirit would hover over us, Lord, this morning, Lord, and that you would touch us, you would speak to us. Even as we read your scripture, Lord, the time of worship, it, it talks about your voice which thunders, your voice which shakes everything up. And I pray, Lord, today your voice would shake us up. Your voice would thunder in our minds and our hearts, Lord, and that we would be shaken up inside out. Lord, and that which is, which is not of you, let it fall. And that which is firm, which, which is grounded in you, let that remain and let the foundations begin once again. Lord, I pray, Lord, for those structures in our life that we have built, which is not on you, the foundation. Let it come down, Lord, today. And I pray that your name would be glorified. Your name would be magnified, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord, for each one of us. I pray that your Holy Spirit would be upon us. And will minister to us, Lord. Lord, I pray for the offerings as well. I pray, Lord, that you would bless it and use it for the extension of your kingdom. I pray for me, Lord. I pray... And even as I share your word, Lord, I would share with grace and love, expressing your mercy, expressing your grace and expressing your righteousness and judgment as well. I commit each one of us, speak through me, Lord, that your Holy Spirit speak through me. And may lay the Holy Spirit cause ears to open, the hearts to open, the minds to open up to receive your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. How wonderful, how marvelous. It is to stand in the presence of our Savior. And I just, even as we sang that song of saying that we stand amazed in His presence, wondering how wonderful the love of God is. Even as I share the word today, and as I prayed that it would shake us up, I said that because I know what I am going to share and how much it can shake us up today. You see, today when I share, I share as a sinner. One among you. One with you. A sinner who has been redeemed. A sinner who has, whose sins have been forgiven. A sinner who has been given hope. A sinner who is not standing today because of any of my righteousness, but because of the righteousness of God. For if we stand, we stand because of Him. 
and no one else. So he sang that song, I need you. Lord, I need you. And I just, I just pray that today we really would come to the point of saying, Lord, I really need you. I really need you because the scripture portions that we are going to read are going to be tough ones. We are going to read portions which are going to challenge our very salvation. Which are going to challenge where we right now stand in Christ. Or whether we stand at all in Him. And I pray that God would give me the grace and help me to understand and put it across in a way to us that would encourage us to draw closer to Him and not away from Him. You see, He, the scripture says that He who did not spare His own Son but gave Him up for us. That verse, that statement carries a lot of weight upon it. A lot of weight upon it. That God, the Father, did not spare. The word did not spare means He found it right, He found it just to even sacrifice His Son who was righteous, who is righteous, who is God Himself. For us. He did not think it wrong. He thought it was right. For us. And that is the price he was willing to pay. For us. God. The God who created the heavens and the earth. The God who is the God of everything. The God almighty. The God holy. God of love, the God of judgment. Find found it good not to spare his own son for your sake and mine. And if he would do that, church, how much is he expecting back from us? I refuse to believe that he would do all that, all that, so that he could gain a people who do not respond to him. I am talking about the church, I am not talking about the people who will reject him, I am talking about the people who, who say they accept him, we, his church, his body. But do not do what he says. I find it very difficult. I, I always struggle with it. I, even as I wrestle with that, I just find it too difficult that God would just say, I'm going to save you. After that, you go and do whatever you want. It doesn't matter because grace is sufficient for you. No. I think we get our God wrong in terms of His expectations from each one of us. And I want you to ask your heart today. I want you to ask yourself today. Where do you stand in Christ? Are we just putting on a show? Are we just I believed in Jesus' name and I am saved. I don't need anything else to be Nothing else needs to be done. My, I just will live my life as I want. I have sins, it's fine. Grace is sufficient. God will forgive me. How is our attitude in our response to this amazing love of God? 
how is the response in our life today? I'm going to talk from the book of 1 John. You can open your Bibles to the book of 1 John. And this is the book that I consider a book that helps us to measure whether we are in Christ or not in the first place. It has some great encouragement, but great verses of warning as well, which we will not be able to understand unless we really dig deep into it. And I want to touch on the nerve of what John the Apostle is saying to each one of us when he wrote this book, when he wrote this this book for us so that when we read it, we try to measure our lives against what's mentioned in this Bible, against what's mentioned in the Word of God. His focus throughout this whole book is about that righteous God and the righteousness that He gave us and the righteousness that He expects from us and the fruit that we are supposed to bear as a result of that righteousness and salvation that has been given to us. He talks about how we need to be protective about our own minds, about our hearts from deception and wrong doctrine that comes into our lives that only encourages us to go and sin more and more. And he deals with it with very strong words. But he also gives us the hope that we have, that is Jesus. He's, he's, he's just laying everything on this person of Jesus and saying, everything that I am telling you in this book is about Him. And it is about His story of Him with you. And what He has done for you. You see, He starts and says, that which was from the beginning. It's very similar, a start of the way He wrote the book of John as well. He says that, that which was from the beginning. You see this. He is going back. That which was right from the start. I am going back to the start. I am going back right before. Nothing was there except God. And he said that which was from the beginning. We know that he is talking about God here. It is he. He was from the beginning. Genesis says in the beginning God. The book of John also says. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. He is talking about Jesus. And he said let me start with whom and from where I am coming. And he starts and says. In the beginning Jesus. Jesus who was in the beginning. Which we have heard. Which we have seen with our eyes. Which we have looked upon and touched with our hands. Concerning the word of life. You see he's, he's saying. I am not talking to you about a fairy tale. I am talking to you. Not of some imaginary person anywhere. I am talking to you about Jesus. The word of God. Life. The light. He's saying I am talking about Jesus. Whom we have seen with our own eyes. Whom we have touched with our own hands. So he's, his, his words are. Very much saying that. I come as someone who has had fellowship with him, who has lived with him, who has spoken to him, who has spent time with him and who has authority given by him. So through that I am speaking to you. And he said concerning the word of life. That life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us that which we have seen and we heard and we proclaim also to you. You know how many times he's trying to just we have seen, we have heard, we have seen, we have heard. You know I am talking about Jesus, that word of God, the life of God, that very life, the very God, the very person of God who manifested here on earth, the eternal life that manifested here in our presence, whom we have seen, whom we have touched. I am proclaiming that to you is what John is saying. That is what we are proclaiming to you. We are not proclaiming to you about any Baba or Rishi or any kind of 
saint or any kind of some person that we talk about who may be holy. No, we are proclaiming to you God. It's like John is telling his children and you'll notice in John's letters he uses the word dear children a lot. Little children. It's like a father sitting with children. Look, look my child, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story of God whom we met, whom we lived with, whom we ate with, who taught us how to live, who lived for us, who died for us. He just talks to the church, he talks to his children, he's saying, little children, listen to me. He said, this is what I have proclaimed to you. He sets those foundations in the place and he says, why am I telling you all this? Why am I telling you all this? He says, so that. He said, yes, we, we had fellowship with him. We spoke to him. We seen him. We touched him. But I'm telling you all this. I'm proclaiming you all this. He goes on to say, so that you too. So that you too may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship indeed is with the Father and with his son Jesus. So we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. I don't know saying the joy is missing. I came up and said the same thing. The joy is missing in our midst. Are we missing someone? Are you missing someone in your life? You see, when you when you get married, the initial period, later on I will comment for later time. Or even much better example is before marriage, when you know you are engaged to someone, you are looking forward to spend time with that person. And then you are with that person. And then suddenly your joy is bubbling. Right? You do really. Did you know? Vinita, no, Noreen is not there, she is at work, but so Vinita is sad today. But otherwise, you would be joyful, right? It's, it's, but it's the feeling of, you know, with that perfect fellowship, that being with the person you love, just being with the person you love brings you complete joy. Everything else doesn't matter anymore. Nothing else matters. And John is saying, we have fellowship with him. And we are telling you this because we want you to have fellowship with us because our fellowship is with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you this, he's saying we are writing these things down for you so that you will not forget. So that when you read this, when you know your joy will be complete, that you have not followed someone who cannot give you joy. Or you are not going to have your life bent on someone or just depending on someone who cannot give you joy but no he's saying your joy will be complete when you are with Jesus and when you are with the Father you see his joy John derived his joy because he's saying our fellowship is with the Father and the Son and our joy is complete I said, and we wanted you, we wanted the church. He said, you have fellowship with us. Because our fellowship is with them and joy will be complete. That's what Aaron said in the start. Do we have fellowship with God? How many of us here can say, I fellowship with God? I 
hands like okay half year okay. somewhere uh, you see where i'm going at what you know where john is going at he said if you belong to jesus you have this wonderful law opportunity to be in fellowship with the godhead and having fellowship with the godhead means you can talk to him one on one and you can hear from him what you need to do and he is with you he is your father he is your savior he is your lord what will you lack the bible there will not be any joy in your life when god the father and the son themselves are in your life and you are having fellowship with them you see it would not matter what is happening around you if you have the father and the son with you and he goes on to say that this is the message we heard from him and proclaimed to him that god is light now he is saying jesus told us this and we are telling you the same thing god is light and in him is no darkness at all you know how he could have the confidence of saying this because john also says this in john he says that no one comes jesus says no one comes to the father except the one who has come from from heaven jesus says he was claiming that he came from him he made that very explicit claim claim saying that he and the father are one so if he and the father he had such intimate relation has such intimate relation with the father that is saying jesus is narrating and telling john this is what god is like this is what the father is like this is what i am like saying god is light and in him there is no darkness at all that's what we say splendor of the king golden majesty he talks about this light and the darkness flees and if we say then he goes on that now with this context of fellowship in mind he said if we say we have fellowship with him why we walk in darkness we lie and do not practice the truth but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship with one another and the blood of jesus his son cleanses us from all sin if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we say we have not sinned we make him a liar and his word is not in us when i read this scripture i feel very encouraged that i can go to jesus i can confess my sins and he will forgive my sins but he starts with something he says if we have fellowship with him he say how can we walk in darkness when he says god is light he's talking this contrast of light and darkness he saying he said god is light <clears throat> matthew chapter 4:16 says the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light and for those dwelling in the region and the shadow of death on them a light has dawned hope light it's like the power was off and you do not know where you are going you need things you can't get them you're worried you're going to stumble and fall and most of us fall because in the darkness we really can't see anything unless there is some assistance or some light and you know what the scripture is saying there is a great light you see in the uh, in norway they call it the land of the midnight sun and during that particular time of the year there is absolutely no light and at times it's so 
so dark that you can't do anything. So what they did is, they have mountains around. They put giant mirrors on top of the mountains where light would reach from the sun. And they reflected that light on the place where they stay. So it's like, you get the picture. They are in darkness, they need light. They don't want to live on electricity all the time. They need, they wanted natural light. So they actually put huge mirrors, huge mirrors on top of the mountains and the light reflects on the city during that time of the year and they can manage themselves well. It's, it's a similar picture that given you. They were living in darkness and a great light has come and has shown and the darkness has gone. But the picture also tells us another truth. It tells us a truth that if a room is dark and someone switches the light on, there is no question of darkness remaining in the room. Do we agree? And John is saying that if we claim that we walk in the light, how can we walk in darkness as well? How is it possible? What are we doing to cause the darkness to remain? In our lives. John chapter 1 verse 4 to 18 says, In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that, that all might believe through him. He was not the light but came to bear witness about the light. The true light which enlightens everyone. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But all to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Born, who, are not, who are born not of blood nor will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. We have seen his glory. Again, he's talking about in person, they have seen him. And we have seen his glory, glory of as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And from His fullness we have all received grace upon grace. It goes on to say, No one has ever seen God, the only God, but He who is at the Father's side. He has made Him known. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And this light that has come and shown in our lives, shown in this world, the world that is full of darkness, is saying, Jesus, I am the light of the world. And that light, when received by someone, enlightens the person. Doesn't darken the person. Doesn't make the person live in darkness. No, but it may. That's the very reason what it is created for. Or what it is meant for rather. To enlighten the person so that the person sees himself in the light of God as who he is, what he is and what does he need and take the solution that God has to offer. And if the light of the world, if the, if the Jesus, the light is in your life and mine, how enlightened are we? How enlightened are you? Are we walking in that light of God, in the light of Christ, or are we still walking in our lives in darkness? Are we still entangled with sin? You see, 
2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14 says Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers For what partnership has righteousness has with lawlessness Or what fellowship has light with darkness He said how can light and darkness have fellowship together Now don't relate this to evangelism Saying that because the scripture is written here We should not have fellowship with darkness Unbelievers are darkness We should not go and give them the gospel Because we will be fellowshipping with them That's not what the scripture is saying But it's saying that if your life is all about Entertaining them and being entertained by them By the ways that they live How can that fellowship be possible if you are a child of God? How can such fellowship be even possible? John chapter 3 verse 19 says And this is the judgment The light has come into the world And people love darkness rather than the light Because their works were evil See, So everyone who does wicked things Hates the light And does not come into the light Lest his works should be exposed But whoever does what is true Comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Jesus said, when he said the words in John chapter 8 verse 12, he says, He said, I am the light of the world. But he added, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. Whoever, not some, not few. He says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness but have the light of life. You see, God is light and He lives in light. He lives in unapproachable light. When John was taken to the presence of God, in the vision through the spirit he just felt dead like dead he just fell down there was, it, it was too much it was too much to handle when Paul saw the vision of Jesus on the road up to Damascus he says the light was brighter than the day it was so bright that it blinded him God isn't living in that kind of light that can just be so piercing that there is absolutely no question for darkness to remain. Absolutely no question. And Jesus is saying, if you have followed me, the light of the world, you will not walk in darkness. Because the light of life is in you. Jesus is in you. You see, when you take a chandelier or you take a... I don't know, whatever you call it. So you have this whole... Uh, it's a chandelier, but you put a bulb inside, what's it called? Lantern. And uh, without the bulb inside, it's, it is very dark. But the moment you switch on the bulb, it lightens up itself within and outside as well. And Jesus said, I am the light of life. I am the bulb which is in you. So you not only shine within, but you are supposed to shine outside and emulate the rest of the place as well. He who walk, follows Jesus does not walk in darkness. Either we believe that word that Jesus said or we, we consider it as half-truth. Either he, whatever he said is fully true or is completely wrong. And I believe our lives should be able to prove whether it's true or not. How many of us have taken Jesus at his word from that perspective and see him as the light? In our life.
And then he goes on to say, but then he interestingly goes on to say, but if we say we have no sin, now that's an interesting turn. So John is saying that you are the light, you are, the, you are supposed to walk in light, not in darkness. But again, if we say we have no sin, then we lie. And I, I was confused. I, I was wondering, uh, how is that? He's, he's saying if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The previous verse says, if we have fellowship with him while we walk in, dark, uh, uh, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. You see, these are two contrasting statements. So what is John really trying to say here? What, what are we supposed to understand out of this? I think what we can understand when we read this, he says, he goes on to say that if we say we have no sin, we deceive, us, deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You see, there's another way, that in one word it says the truth is not in us. If we say we are not sinners, but earlier verse it says, if we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. It's one thing for having the truth to be in us, and it's another thing for practicing the truth. When the light shines within us, it exposes the dark areas of our lives and keeps exposing it. And we are supposed to bring it to the light and then we are supposed to get it up, get done with it. And it says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar. And the word is not in us. James chapter 3 verse 2 says, For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body. But he knows, that's why he makes the first statement, he says, we all stumble. First, get that right. We all stumble in many ways. And what John, so we can understand by this, it says, what John is trying to say, if Jesus is in you, the light, and you're walking in the light, there will be aspects of not, not that, uh, that sin where you knowingly go and do sin, knowing that it is sin, it is lawlessness, not that. There, there's an aspect of you keep sinning. Because he says, he call, call says one thing very clearly, he says that, you see, if we have, you, you can have fellowship with us. He starts with fellowship with us. But there's another portion which goes, which he actually talks about, where he says that if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Now there are two ways to look at that fellowship. One is the earlier portion where he says, You have fellow if, if you have fellowship with us, our fellowship is with the Father. But then the preceding verse to this verse says that if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness. So the relation here is trying to put, John is trying to say is that. Our fellowship is supposed to be with Jesus and with the church. And as we have fellowship with one another and we walk in the light, the light of God, the light of life, so as to say, brings to our attention areas of darkness that we have still not considered. But as soon as the Holy Spirit brings it to light, we go to Him and we confess our sins and we ask for forgiveness. He talks about as we fellowship with one another, there are those moments of friction. <coughs> the moments, the, some people that we do not really love. But we are forced to love, so as to say. Which in itself is wrong. But then there's moments of friction, the misunderstanding. He says, the moment you come across those things, as you are in fellowship with one another and with God, the Holy Spirit will point it out to you. Confess your sins at that moment. The blood of Jesus will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. It's not talking about your past sins. It's talking about your sins that you get into, which are not planned sins. Sins which are not, you know it's a sin, but you still do it. Not those kinds. These are those 
never planned, it just happened, unknowingly it just happened. You are not careful, it happened. You go to Jesus, you ask Him forgiveness, you confess your sins to Him. Say, yes Lord, I, I confess, I am sorry. And the blood of Jesus cleanses you of all sins. You see, it was, it is the blood of Jesus it's, which cleanses us from everything. It is, it is of Him who it is, what is told that behold, He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It is His blood that was shed on the cross that cleanses us and it is not been shed so that we go on sinning. But it has been shed so that we are freed from our sin. What is our attitude towards sin today? Each one. What are the sins that you and I are doing which we know we are not supposed to do but are still doing? That is walking in darkness. We know we are not supposed to do something. Maybe an addiction. Maybe anger. Maybe jealousy. Maybe unforgiveness. And Jesus very clearly said in the Lord's Prayer that if you do not forgive the sins of others, the Father is not going to forgive your sins. That's walking in the light. That's walking in the light because new fictions will happen. And he's saying, if there's an ash, he says the time you have to forgive people, you better go and forgive. In fact, even the communion, when you're supposed to receive it, it very clearly goes on to say that if you have or an offering, if you have something against someone, please go and settle that before you come and give your offering. Walking in the light. That is walking in the light. See, there is this wonderful aspect of forgiveness but it comes when you confess. It comes when we confess before our Lord knowing that we have done so much wrong. Leviticus chapter 26 verse 40 to 42 it says but if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers and treachery which they have committed against me and also in walking contrary to me so that I walk contrary to them and brought them into the land of the enemies. You see, when we consciously do things which are against God, contrary to God, which are treacherous in His eyes, He says, I will walk contrary to you. And that is what James also says when he says, if, if father, because the father loves you, if you keep doing something stupid, he will discipline you. He disciplines you not because he doesn't love you, but because he loves you. And he, 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 to the Israelites, he loved them so much that he said, I will give you over to your enemies. But he never abandoned them. He still pursued them. When David's sin was found out and punishment was going to be given to him, he said it is better to fall into the hands of God rather than to fall in the hands of the enemy. Let, let God discipline me. I don't want the enemy to discipline me. Where do you and I stand today, church? These scripture portions so far sound very encouraging, by the way. That you can go and ask for forgiveness. But there is some other portion which I want us to further read in the same book. Which will help us to understand what really the heart of God is when He's talking in this scripture verses. You see, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 to, uh, verse 1 to 6 says, My little children, again, the heart of a father, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. 
But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. My one defense, advocate. My righteousness. Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for us only but for the, also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know Him. By this we know. He's saying, look, Jesus died for you so that you will not sin. By this we will know that we come to know Him if we keep His commandments. But whoever says, I know Him but does not keep His commandments is a liar and the truth is not in Him. But whoever keeps His word in Him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in Him. Whoever says He abides in Him ought to walk in the same way that He walked. You know, this is a very, very challenging word. He said, if you claim to be in Christ, you have to walk like Jesus. Not like Paul, not like Peter, not like any of the saints, not like any of the, any of the holiest men you can think of, but walk like Jesus walked. Is he our role model? Is he the one we are following? Jesus said, follow me and you will not walk in darkness. He didn't say, follow any of the best people on earth that you can think of who are my disciples. No. Follow me and you will not walk in darkness. How many of us are following him and walking like Jesus walked? How many of You see, He is our advocate. Yes, He is there. He is he's mediating for us. But you see, imagine Jesus as a judge, or not a judge, the advocate for you. And you are in a... Your attitude towards sin is... I'll sin anyways. Grace is sufficient for me. Grace of God is enough. I'll be forgiven, I'll be, I can live, my, you know, the blood of Jesus is enough. And then you go to Jesus and you keep doing your sinfulness. You just keep continuing. And you go to Jesus and you stand there in the court. And God is there and Jesus is your advocate, your mediator, your, uh, the one who is defending you. And God, the Father is saying, look at him or look at her. And Jesus in my blood has cleansed him. He is righteous. He is, there is no judgment for him. And Jesus in his heart will be thinking, He didn't follow me at all. He just claimed to be my follower. Kept saying the blood of Jesus is enough for me. Keep clean, cleaning me. It's like one tap I open and just stand underneath the tap and it keeps cleaning me. I will go get dirty again. Come stand up, take a bath again. Okay, go get again. Come back and take a bath again. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus cleanses me of all sin. I am righteous. I am true. But I keep going back and going like a pig. I go and keep dirtying myself in muck. And again come back in the tap of the water of blood of Jesus and then get cleansed and say, Okay, I am Jesus. Now I am standing in the court. Please be my advocate and defend me. What did Jesus say? There's a verse for that also in the Bible. Get away from me, all you doers of lawlessness. I do not know you. But Jesus, we healed in your name. We did this in your name. We prophesied in your name. I do not know you. Get away from me. Hebrews says, you are like trampling the Son of God under your feet when you keep doing that. How can we just go on sinning and think we can just go and confess our sins every time with an attitude that I can still sin, it doesn't matter. That doesn't work. It does not work. Jesus was very clear. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Do we love him? By this the world will know that you are my disciples if you keep my commandments.
Jesus told the Pharisees, he said in John chapter 8 verse 40 verse says, You are of your father the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. Strong words. He was telling people, scribes and Pharisees who were claiming to be followers of God. Self-righteous people. Maybe we are among them. And Jesus is telling them, you are of your father the devil. Are you interested in knowing where he tells us the same thing? I'll show you whether he's talking to us as well, okay? Let's read after uh, some time. We'll come to know whether he talks something like that to the church as well. But in John chapter 8 verse 40, he continues. He says, he was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. John chapter 14 verse 21 to 24 says, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. You see, Jesus wants to make his presence known to us. His promise in this is what we can see is if you love me and you keep my commandments my father will love you I will love you and I will make myself manifest before you. Isn't that amazing? See, like I will come and manifest myself before you. Because if you love me and you obey my commandments. Now is the portion where these scripture verses shake me up. And I hope it shakes you up as well. See what kind of 1, 1, John, 1 John chapter 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us. That he should that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is it did not know him. Beloved. We are God's children now. Say, beloved, look, look my children. We are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when, we, when He appears, we shall be like Him because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as He is pure. Now, if Christ has already sanctified us and made us clean, what is this purification he's talking about? He's saying that everyone who thus hopes in him, everyone, each one of us who hopes in Jesus, purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either, either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the... Is of the... What's written in the Bibles? One John chapter three verse eight. Can everyone read it from your from your own Bibles? Is it similar to the verse that he read out to the Pharisees? That is uh, that is spoken to the Pharisees. The devil was a liar from the beginning, and he's saying that whoever practice makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the son of God appears was to destroy the works of the devil. So no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. Now I am using this. The ESC version talks about 
makes a practice of sinning makes it sound like somebody living continually in sin all right but the actual translation or the actual uh, root word there is anyone who sins it doesn't say practice of sinning or continues in sin no it says anyone who sins is of the devil very strong words very very strong words and it scares me it scares me for it says that no one born of god makes a practice of sinning for god's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he is born of god by this it is evident who are the children of god and who are the children of the devil whoever practices righteousness uh, does not practice righteousness is not from god nor is the one who does not love his brother See when I come to this portion of scripture, it I tremble. I I wonder, Lord, where do I stand? Where do I stand? Whoever does not practice righteousness is of the devil. Is it sinking in your heart? out of the entire while when i come to only this portion i i fear a real lot and until this time i always used to encourage me no no before this chapter 1 he actually said if you confess your sins is lord of jesus is able to cleanse you all your sins so that is also that this is all same author is saying it's fine but the progression is not in that way the progression was first confess and then he goes on here in chapter 3 See what God is trying to say here is and I'm sure there are many interpretations that people have tried to make of this. I was trying to just go through the commentaries and try to understand what different people are saying and you know some people said that no it's actually not just uh, like let me read the exact verse that it says here it says he who in the nkjv version it says he who sins is of the devil for the devil has sinned from the beginning for this purpose the son of god has manifested that he may destroy the works of the devil whoever has been born of god does not sin for his seed remains in him and he cannot sin see there is not sin and he cannot sin for as we he has been born of god and i was, it checks me because i I am not able to understand that in its completeness. That's why I started saying I am a sinner like you. It just shakes me. If I am born of God, if I am a born again child of God, then I do not sin. I cannot sin. Is what either I take the scripture at its meaning, or like few people have said. No, it basically says if you continually live in sin, if you make it a practice of sinning, like few of the uh, versions talk, uh, put it. That is, I just want to go on sinning. I take the scripture literal. The scripture says, whoever is born of God does not sin, cannot sin, because God. seed is in him and then there was one person who said you know you got the flesh and you got the spirit and it the spirit will not sin so it is this part which does not sin but it this part which sins but both are led together no the flesh versus the spirit and paul also talks about that in romans he says you know what i want to do i do not do what i don't want to do i do oh this treacherous body of mine I, but 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 he ends it but thanks be to god in christ jesus
But thanks be to God in Christ Jesus. If I have to take this scripture versus this portion and I also take the portion that John that is there in 1 John 1 which talks about if you say you have no sin then you are a liar. I have to put both of them together. I cannot read them only two separate blocks. But when I put this to spirit and I look at the end, scripture in its entirety and look at the grace of God and look at the power of God. Now listen to me. Church, we are talking about following a God who is almighty, who is holy, who is righteous, who is a living God, who is our father. He has given birth to us. We are born again in this life again so that we can live different than the old life. And an old man was crucified. Unless before he died, we took him down from the cross and said, no, 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 we can live for some more time. The scripture doesn't say anything like that. It just says your old man was crucified and the new man has come alive. The desires and intentions of the old man was put to death. And the desires of the new man which is in the nature of Christ has been made alive. Because of that scripture says that you are a new creation in Christ. The old has gone, the new has come. And then the new keeps going back and saying the old is still there somewhere. I have a problem with that. Because scripture says the old has gone. If it's gone, it cannot come back. And if we say the old is still there, then the new has not come. Then we have not put ourselves to that. We have not confessed in the way we should confess to Jesus. We have not allowed the light of Jesus to come in us and be the light of life. We have not allowed the Holy Spirit to do His outworking in us and through us. We have done a part favor to God. We have done a mental acknowledgement. Jesus died for my sins. I will live with Him. I will be there. But I have not, my life in itself has not been transformed. The Holy Spirit is not in me. That's why I keep saying the old is still there. I'm telling you, God is not weak. Amen? Our God is not weak. And if He has done something on the cross and He said it is finished, it is finished. If He has defeated sin and then He has defeated it, it is not part. And if we have victory, if He has got the victory and says, fear not, I have overcome the world, which if He has overcome, I can overcome too. If He has victory, I have victory too. How can I say, how there's something wrong in my belief, in my understanding, when I keep saying, my old is still alive. It is, cannot be alive, because you are a, you're supposed to be a new creation. And if you have a doubt today that you are a new creation, and your old is still alive, then you have not given yourself or surrender yourself to Jesus in, com in, com in the completion, complete way that, you are, you are, that we should have. And it's never too late because breath is still in you and still in me. God still allows us to breathe, take the next breath because He still wants us to come back to Him if we are not with Him. Every breath is an opportunity. Every breath is a chance. Every breath is grace given by Him saying, come now. Come now. Repent. Come now. I want to give you life, not half life. Jesus didn't say that you may have life. He said you may have abundant life. I cannot think of abundant life and joy when I walk in darkness as well. It kills me. It has killed me. I struggle with that big time church. 
That's what eats up my mind so much saying how can I claim to be a child of God and walk in darkness at the same time it just does not go together. It does not go together. It doesn't go for me. It will not go for you. Our God is not so weak. And our faith is not supposed to be so weak. And his victory is not so shallow. If he has given victory, it is complete victory. If he has saved you, he has saved you completely. Not partially. He has forgiven you, he has forgiven you completely, not partially. Yes, there is an aspect of past salvation, present and future salvation. But future salvation is more from the perspective that we will go in His presence. We will be free from this world of sin. The worldliness, we will be set free from that and then live with Him. It's not about continually being forgiven. There is an aspect of repentance, which I will talk about now. Which John is trying to talk here. What he is really saying is that, look church, and what I have understood. And if you feel otherwise, you can come and talk to me. But this is what I believe. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Who was holy, who was righteous, who was without sin. And He died for the entire world. And He died so that He would, he would be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Not some of them, but all of them. And lays it upon Himself and drinks of the cup of wrath that the cup of anger that the father had for you and for me he took it upon himself so that we could live and we could be forgiven and we could have life and we could have abundant life and we could have joy and we could have peace with God now I cannot imagine of joy and peace and the Holy Spirit coming and being with us when we still want to live in sin it does not go together when repentance is supposed to be done in our life, when we have confessed our sins to God, we are actually saying, I am going, coming to God and turning away from my sinfulness. And when Jesus says, I will forgive you, and He gives you the Holy Spirit, when He gives the Holy Spirit, when He comes and lives in us, it is light in us. And the Holy Spirit is not weak, but He is powerful. It is the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead and says that same power which raised Jesus from the dead is living in you and me. It is that same Holy Spirit that makes us the holy temple of God. And John is saying, those who have believed in this Jesus walk in the light. They do not commit sins which they know are sinful and they consciously keep going and doing it. He is saying those kind of sins they will not do. Once you know the law, once you know the commandments of God, once you know that this is what God says, obey. And you know about it and you still go and do it out of your own free will. Then that is not being saved. That is you are still in your sin. You are still walking in darkness. And John is saying you can't do that. But if there are those aspects are there where as we fellowship with one another and fellowship with God, if we do happen to sin unknowingly, unknowingly, it just happened. Yes, by mistake it happened, or sometimes our foolishness drives us there. He says, for those kind, those kinds of sins or those kinds of times when, when it comes in your life, you go to God and ask for forgiveness. Confess your sins before him, and he the blood of Jesus will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. <laughs> You see, there is scope for that. But there is no scope for a believer to say, a believer who says, Jesus is in me, a father is in me, to say that I will continually do what my past old man was doing. I, will I know this is sinful in God's eyes, but I will still do it. The little bit of darkness here and there doesn't matter. No, he says this is not possible. There is no fellowship of the light and darkness. And we, he calls us to believe that if we believe in the Son of God, will not the light of the world enlighten you? How many of us believe that? That the light of the world, Jesus will enlighten us. Can we raise our hands? 
church, the light of the world, will enlighten us and help us to overcome all sin, not part of them. We can live righteous lives. That's what the Bible calls us to. That's what Jesus calls us to. There will be those times when we fall. Jesus lifts us up. Forgives us. We move on. But our attitude towards sin doesn't remain the same. Our old man attitude doesn't remain the same. Our old man was, by default we will do it, doesn't matter. But our new man, in the new man, the Holy Spirit keeps telling us, don't do it. Don't do it. And we listen to that voice and we don't do it. But when we keep hearing that voice, don't do it. I'm not talking about being saved here. I'm talking about walking in the light. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about walking in the light. And the Holy Spirit keeps telling you. We hear His voice and we walk. We walk in the light. But we ignore that voice. Then the Bible talks about do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And sometimes we can grieve him to the point that he remains silent. And then God will say, Not my will, but yours be done. May we never come to the point where God tells us, Not my will, but yours be done. Let it be today. Today is the day. Now is the time that we say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Amen. Can we just can you take the next two, three minutes to think about what God has spoken to us through his scripture and try to understand which are those areas in our life which we have not surrendered to him. Maybe we have not really believed completely the gospel, the complete gospel. Maybe we don't have the Holy Spirit in us. Maybe we have just made a mental acceptance but never from the heart. Maybe all this time we have been just fooling ourselves and living our own lives in parallel as well. Just like we used to live in the past. Now is the time to change that. Now is the time to change that for each one of us. I have been fed up with that kind of life, church. I have been fed up with that kind of life. And I want to see that happen so much completely, completely in my life. And I wish it for all of us. All of us. Let's be fed up of our sins. Let's be fed up of our sins. Just give it off. Give it off. Father, as we, the Lord God Almighty, God of the heavens and the earth, God the Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for, for Jesus. We thank you for your love that you have for us, that you sent us your Son. You did not spare him, Lord. But you found it worthy for him to die on the cross and take all the shame on our sickness, on our sin upon himself and die for us so that we could have the light of life. So that we could have new birth. And our old man would be dead. And the new creation would come to existence in us and your Holy Spirit to come and live in us and we have fellowship with you O oh Father and fellowship with the Lord Jesus and fellowship with the saints oh what a wonderful fellowship it is where 
Holiness abounds. Righteousness abounds. And darkness flees. For this is the heaven on earth picture that you had when you thought about your church. That your will would be done in our lives as it is in heaven. Your honor. O oh Lord, I pray for each one of us that if we have been faking our salvation, if we are faking our lives and we are still living in our old self, I pray you would forgive us, Lord. I thank you that you have given us breath to even this moment so that we can turn and come back to you and we can live and that we can follow your lead, Lord Jesus, and we can walk in the light and darkness will not touch us. Because it cannot comprehend the light that you give us. The Lord gave, put in us a desire to love you. Pas be passionate about you and your kingdom. About following you and your commandments, O oh Lord. Lord, even as we read, Lord, that if we love you, if we love you, we will walk in your commandments. We will not sin.